CUBE conversation. Uh, we're here in our Palo Alto studios with Fortinet's Anthony Giandomenico. Anthony, welcome. Oh, welcome, um, it's great to be here. So, or otherwise it's known as Tony G. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> the, in the CUBE conversations, Tony, we want to talk about interesting and relevant things. Well, here's an interesting and relevant thing that just happened. Uh, Fortinet has put forward their quarterly threats report. What is it, what's in it? Yeah. So really it's something we do on a quarterly basis and it's really geared towards the IT security professional, right? So we go from the CISO all the way down to the security operator. And what we're looking at is billions of events that are being observed in real time, you know, production environments around the world. And what we're hoping to do is look at different types of trends that are specific to application exploits, malware, and botnets, and hopefully then provide some recommendations back to those IT security professionals. Now Tony, malware has been around for a while. Uh, some of the bots are a little bit new, but certainly there are some real new things that are on the horizon, like IoT. And we've heard recently that there's been some challenges with some of these IoT devices. Is the threat getting more or less intensive according to the report? Yeah, you know, definitely is getting more you know, sophisticated, you know, specifically with these IoT devices. Um, you know, what we're seeing um, as an example with you know, the Reaper and Hajime, Always have a hard time actually pronouncing that, so I think it's Hajime. Um, they're actually starting to attack multiple vulnerabilities, right? So instead of just going after one vulnerability, they have multiple vulnerabilities that, they, um, that is inside their you know, malicious code, and then they have the ability to automate the exploitation of those vulnerabilities depending on what the IoT devices are. Now, they're also becoming a lot more resilient. And what I mean by that is some of the actual botnets like Hajime is able to communicate via P2P to each other, what that kind of creates is a decentralized command and control infrastructure. Um, and then lastly, they have this, um, they're, you know, they're becoming much more agile as well, right? They have this Lua engine, which enables them to quickly update their code. So, you know, I'll give you an example. Let's say there's a new vulnerability out there. They can quickly swap out or add the additional exploit for that vulnerability, propagate that out to all of the IoT um, you know, devices that are part of the botnet, and then they can swarm in on that new vulnerability. So Fortinet's FortiGuard Labs is one of the leading researchers in the, this area, yep. especially internet enterprise security. Yeah. Uh, what is your recommendations that people do about the increasing intensity of the IoT threats? Yeah. So I think we need to start, you know, you know, at least thinking about fighting these um, you know, automation attacks or swarm attacks with our own swarm-like defenses and you know what i mean by that is really having a a seamless integration and automation across your entire security fabric now there's a lot that actually kind of goes into that but your technology controls need to start talking to each other and then you can start automating um you know and taking some action really based on whatever threat happens to be in your environment now um it's easier said than done but if you can do that you can start automating the continual resistance or resiliency of you know, being able to you know, actually defend against those automated attacks. So let's change gears a little bit. Uh, Willie Sutton, I think it was Willie Sutton, the famous bank robber, was famous for saying, uh, when I, someone asked him, why do you rob banks? He said, that's because where the money is. All of the money. <laughs> Crypto jacking. <laughs> yep. What's going on with, as Bitcoin becomes a, a bigger feature yeah, of the sure, global sure. landscape, what's happening with crypto jacking? Yeah. What is it, how does it work? Why should we be concerned about it? Well, definitely cryptocurrency is becoming more and more popular these days, right? And the bad guys are definitely taking advantage of that. So, you know, when you talk about what is crypto jacking, so it's really, it's sharing, um, you know, or secretly using the CPU resources to be able to mine for cryptocurrencies. Now, you know, traditionally, you used to have to put some type of application on your machine to be able to mine for cryptocurrencies. Nowadays, all the bad guys really have to do is install a little JavaScript in your browser and away to go, you know? Um, and the only way that you're going to know that um, your machine may be part of this mining is it may become super slow and, you know, you may be savvy enough, say, well, you know, let me look at the CPU. And you look at it and it's pegged at 100%. You know? So that's, that's one of the ways that you can determine that your computer is part of, um, you know, crypto mining. Now, in the Q4 report, what we've seen is a huge uptake in crypto mining malware. And it's interesting because it's very intertwined with the rise and fall of the Bitcoin price. So as we saw the Bitcoin price go up, the crypto mining malware you know, went up and as it actually dropped off, so did the activity. The other thing that we actually ended up 
you know, seeing is actually in the dark net, there's a bit of a shift where, you know, the bad guys used to only accept, um, you know, payment in Bitcoin. Now they're looking at accepting other forms of actual cryptocurrency. And that also holds true for ransomware. So if you have to get infected with ransomware, it's quite possible that they're going to demand that ransom in something other than Bitcoin. Interesting. So, in fact, we had a great uh, previous Cube conversation mm. with another really yeah. esteemed Fortinet guest, and we talked a little bit about this. But, uh, so one of, the, one of the prescriptions is, you know, businesses have to be careful about the degree to which they think about doing a lot of transactions in cryptocurrencies, but they probably want to have a little bit of reserves just in case. But what should a business do? What should someone do to uh, mediate some of the challenges associated with CryptoJack? Yeah, you know, I think one of the first things, I mean, you know, it, it's, it's probably self-explanatory, um, you know, to most of us that are actually in, you know, the cyber field, but having good user awareness training program that actually includes keeping up with the latest and greatest tactics, techniques, and the actual threats that the bad guys are doing out there. You know, the, you know they're the obvious thing would probably be just make sure that your security solutions are able to detect the crypto mining URLs and malware. And I would also say, um, you know, because now I'm not condoning that you actually pay the ransom. <laughs> However, it's been happening, you know, it's happened many times where, you know, they've paid, I think there were some companies that actually paid over a million dollars in Bitcoin. Um, it may actually be an option. And if you have that in your incident response plan and, you know, what you want to do sometimes, and, you know, we've seen organizations actually go ahead and do this, is they'll buy some Bitcoin, kind of keep it on hand. So if they do have to pay, it streamlines that entire process. Because ransomware, the actual ransom now, you may not be able to pay in Bitcoin. You probably have to keep abreast of what are the actual trends in paying that particular ransom because you may have to have other cryptocurrencies on hand as well. So make sure your security is up to date, that you can track these the particular and specific uh, resources that yep. tend to do this. Have a little bit on reserve, sure. but make sure that you are also tracking which of the currencies Exactly. Are most uh, being used. Yes. Uh, so uh, there are other exploits, uh, as you said earlier. You know, now we see people with some of the malware thinking about doing peer-to-peer -peer type of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, the bad guys are constantly innovating. Uh, some would argue that they're more inventive than the good guys because mm -hmm. they got less risk to worry about. Yeah. Uh, what other threats is the report starting to highlight? That people need to start thinking about. Yeah, so, so in this um, you know, Q4 report, what we did is we added in the top exploit kit. Um, and uh, I think we'll probably continue to do that over the- um, well, What's you know, an exploit kit? Um, exploit kit is something, it's, it's a very nice little kind of GUI that allows you to really just kind of point and click. Um, has multiple exploits in there, and it's usually browser based, so it's going to be able to um, you know, to be able to compromise, you know, usually a vulnerability within the browser or some of the actual browser plugins, you know, things of that nature. And the one that we had in the Q4 report was the Sundown uh, exploit kit. Now, um, it was interesting because, you know, we didn't necessarily see that one on the top. Um, it might have been um, top of its game, maybe 2014, 2015, uh, but it actually rose um, in early December to actually kind of be number one for Q4. And it's unique because it does leverage steganography, you know, meaning it's able to hide, you know, its malicious code or its harvested information inside image files. Um, so we'll continue to track that. We're not sure why it actually kind of rose up in the beginning of, you know, December. Uh, but we'll just actually continue to track it over time. So you've already mentioned ransomware, but let's return to it because that's at the top of people's minds. Yeah. As you, you know, we pay lawyers when they come after us with sometimes <laughs> what looks like ransom. Yeah. But uh, what is happening? What's the trend in ransomware? Uh, what are what are some of the what's the report revealing? Yeah. Well, what you see is um, you know the actual growth in volume and sophistication has really been common amongst all you know the reports that we have actually put out to date. Um, so not a lot has really changed. Um, in Q4, what we did have, um, Locky was a number one malware, or um, I should say, uh, your ransomware variant, along with Global Imposter. Now, you know, it's still the same delivery mechanisms, right? So you still got the, you know, social en uh, engineering, it's being delivered through phishing email, but then it, it's expanding out to, let's say, you know, compromised websites, malvertising, um, as well as, um, uh, you know, earlier on last year, we saw where it was being able to propagate 
from vulnerability to vulnerability. So it had this worm-like spreading capability. That's all really been the same and not a lot has really sort of changed. Um, the thing that has changed actually is the fact that they're up in the ante a little bit to be able to hopefully increase their chances of you actually falling for that actual scam is they're making the subject of that scam a little bit more top of mind. I, I, um, as an example, the subject may be cryptocurrency. Um, so you're more likely to figure out what's going on there. You'll be more likely to download that file or you know, click that link if the subject is something around you know, cryptocurrency because it is you know, top of mind today. Yeah, interestingly enough, I this morning received an email saying, you could win some free cryptocurrency. And I said, and you could go into the trash can. <laughs> so what should people do about it? I just threw something away. But what should people generally do to protect their organization from things like ransomware? You know, I do get that a lot. I get that question a lot. You know, the first thing I say, if you're trying to protect against ransomware, you know, you, you follow the same things that you were doing with some of the other threats. Because I don't think ransomware is that unique when it comes to the protection. The uniqueness is really an impact, right? Because you know, certain threats, they'll actually, you know, they'll go and steal data and whatnot. But when was the last time you heard of a business going out of business or losing money because you know, some data was stolen? Um, not, you know, not very often, right? You know, it just seems to be continued as you know, business as usual. But ransomware, locking your files, it can actually bring the business down, right? So really what you want to do is be able to minimize the impact of that actual ransomware. So having a good um, offline backup strategy, so good backup and recovery strategy, making sure you go through those tabletop exercises, you know, really to make sure that when you do have to recover, you know exactly how long it's going to take and it's very efficient and very streamlined. Practice, practice, practice. Yep. And don't rely on online backups, um, you know, shadow copy backups, because those things um, are probably going to be encrypted as well. Yep. All right. So that's all we got time for today, Tony. Cool. Uh, so, uh, to uh, Anthony Giandomenico uh, from Tony G. Tony G. <laughs> from uh, who's a senior security strategist and researcher at the Fortinet Fortinguard Labs. Thanks very much for this CUBE conversation. Huh. It was great to be here. Peter Burris, once again, we'll see you in the next CUBE conversation.